and uh, that will allow uh, opportunity for people to uh, view it because there's going to be some great uh, knowledge imparted from Maggie and from uh, Navi uh, today. Um, so when you both are ready, let us know and uh, uh, we can begin. Hey, I'm good. Okay. Same here. Fantastic. Well, welcome everybody to uh, Brampton Board of Trades uh, Trade uh, Network. Uh, today, we have uh, two guests, uh, Maggie Weaver of Shaftesbury uh, Associates and Navidami from, uh, Navidami from uh, Ex Export Development uh, Canada. Uh, our topics uh, today will uh, be uh, on the uh, important components of market research and exporting. Uh, Maggie is an expert uh, in that. I'll uh, read her uh, uh, introduction, her bio, uh, and uh, that's testament to, to uh, that fact. And uh, Navi, of course, uh, helps many clients uh, throughout uh, Peel uh, region uh, to enter uh, new, uh, new markets. Let me uh, uh, thank uh, the Export Development Corporation for their sponsorship uh, of uh, today's uh, uh, webinar and network uh, meeting. And uh, Maggie, welcome. Uh, let, allow me to uh, uh, tell the uh, viewers today a little bit about uh, your uh, background. Uh, you have been helping small businesses uh, uh, learn more about international trade and market research through workshops, uh, uh, delivered through small business centers across Ontario. Uh, you also taught the International Trade Research uh, Continuing Education Program at Seneca and yep. the workshop on trade compliance uh, for FIT, the Forum uh, for International Trade uh, Training. Uh, for the last 20 uh, years, you've been uh, uh, self-employed and providing uh, business information for important associations like Canadian Importers and Exporters, uh, that's IE Canada, the Canada Ontario Export Forum, uh, Forum COEF, and uh, the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development uh, and, uh, and Trade, in addition to workshops uh, uh, on market research, uh, importing and exporting. You, you are also an author. You are uh, the, the guru, the uh, chief uh, librarian, advisor, uh, and consultant on all things uh, uh, SME uh, and export related, and, and your book, Guide to Online Export Resources, is the Bible uh, for so many uh, looking to uh, expand uh, their, their markets around the world. You've done that for the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development and Trade, also a step-by-step -step guide uh, to importing uh, for IE Canada, the Ontario Export Toolbox for, so, uh, for uh, COEF, and Research for Europe, a resources toolbox for Ontario exporters. Uh, welcome, Maggie. We're so happy that you're uh, here uh, today and we're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, I have fun doing it. <laughs> good, fun is good. I always have fun. You know that Todd likes that. Yes. We, went, we met on the COEF board, so. Yeah, uh, sure. Okay, I, I would like to share a screen. So is that okay with me to do that? Good. Am I good to do that now? I'm very happy to be here. I had a lot of fun doing this. Um, let me find share screen. Share screen. Share. And I will put this on the slideshow from the beginning. So there's me. In uh, happier times, I was in a cafe. <laughs> I haven't been in a cafe for a very long time. Mm. Okay. Um, so what I think of myself as doing is encouraging small business to get involved in export. And the, as, a co as the COEF person, the only COEF employee, as it happened, um, for 17 years, I was actually um, out there jollying the troops and motivating people and um, uh, making it seem very straightforward. There are lots of people out there to help. Um, but the first connection, the on-ramp, is, is not obvious to most people. And uh, so I felt it was my job to provide the on-ramp. And uh, now I'm self-employed, fully self-employed, without contracts pretty much of any kind. Um, I'm doing this through the market research approach, because this is the big gap in the services that are available to people. And since market research is just what gets me up in the morning, I'm very happy to be doing that. All right, so uh, my agenda is, why do I care about small business in 
respect to exporting, what's available for them and what should they be researching and let's be realistic about what they should be researching. And then some key uh, tools that I teach them uh, if possible. And then the very important step of handing off to the support agencies because there's no point in having an arm ramp if there isn't anything at the bottom of the ramp. And uh, so I'm, that's a really good fit to have EDC as part of this because that's a classic, a classic handoff that I would have made. In fact, normally my last slide was an introduction to EDC. So um, I will be mentioning some of the programs that I do as I go along, but mostly I've just extracted from the things that I've done in the past. So I don't have much to say about that. Why do I, why do I think trade's important? You know, um, this is one of these big statistics things that uh, most people really don't. I'm gonna try and get rid of this screen. I can't see anything. Okay. Um, this is from OECD. And what they've done is uh, put the statistically graph, the contribution that trade makes to different um, GDPs. So um, by contrast to the, the US, which is on the left-hand side, which is the smallest, um, their uh, contribution of trade to their GDP, because their GDP is so large, not because their trade is small, um, is very minor. Um, we are at the yellow arrow and um, OECD average is, sorry, I haven't got my glasses on. I can't see OECD average on that slide. <laughs> Um, but China is the blue one to the, uh, uh, the bright blue one to the left. And uh, Germany is the one on, uh, Korea is the one on the right. You can't see, I can't see Germany because I've got your picture in the way, but Germany is on the far right. So it's a major contributor to uh, our, our GDP. Um, Canada's uh, exports represent 31% of GDP or contribute 31% to GDP. Compare that with Germany, which is 46%, uh, the UK, which is only 28%, and the USA, which is under 12%. So uh, our exports are important. Of course, imports are slightly higher than that uh, for us, naturally, uh, but it is a major contributor to the GDP. So to me, it's important to get those uh, small businesses trading uh, because our market isn't big enough anyway. Most who would set up to be a market researcher in a country with a very small market? I mean, anyway, that's what I did. So, uh, so I have to go and make some business for myself. All right, so why do I like small business? Now, let me see if I can move this screen. Yeah. Here we are. Okay, so um, I said, or Innovation Canada has picked up again, starting restarted its key small business statistics which lapsed a little while. And most recently they had a, their survey of key source business statistics had a section on, um, on export, just one paragraph or one chapter, but not a huge amount, but some very interesting statistics. Um, small businesses <laughs> up to 99 employees, which is to me quite a large business actually, but up to 99 employees uh, contribute 19% of the value of exported goods. They represent a huge number of, of companies. That's about 45,000 businesses. So all of those businesses, because they're all exporting, all ought to be EDC uh, clients, all of them. Uh, because once they've got a contract, they ought to have gone to EDC for uh, contract insurance. And that's why I'm so glad you're talking about contracts. And I always ended my sessions to bit small business with EDC. Uh, of course, it's, Maggie, just keep going. This is great. Just keep going. I like this. <laughs> I knew you'd know that. I knew you'd know. That. <laughs> anyway, so um, obviously it behooves me, and I think EDC should be dropping a few pennies my way to push all these forty-five thousand businesses towards you. And I know who they are. <laughs> anyway, so um, of course, although manufacturing is important, it's not the they're not actually pushing very hard in the manufacturing area. Mostly, they're pushing in the wholesale trade area. And I found it very interesting, I didn't realize this, that the second and third most significant destinations for small business are China and Japan, which really does surprise me. So I get China, that's the second one for the whole of the country, but uh, first is obviously US. Anyway, so these statistics are very current and uh, I know that you guys like to have very current statistics, so uh, working on that. All right, now when I was at COEF, um, as uh, Todd mentioned, I was collecting information on, for everybody in the COEF community 
on um, the resources that are available to them as business advisors so that they are kept up to date as well. So not just it's not just my job to tell, it was not just my job to tell the small businesses what the programs of the COEF members were, but also to tell the COEF programs <laughs> what was out there for them. Uh, so on the, the, the top here, the two at the top are um, uh, the typical entries that I had in my toolkit that went to the all COEF partners, uh, including EDC. Yeah, of course, it has. I don't know if it's been updated since they kicked me out, but um, uh, I'm keeping it up. So um, uh, the destination export was the Federation of Small Business in the UK, and they talk quite a bit about um, more diverse markets. And that's exactly what, in the UK, that's not unusual, of course, but they had been very focused on Commonwealth before. Um, but the, because of the digital uh, revolution within the small businesses. So that one's from 2016, which has appeared in the toolkits that you have. The um, one on the left is from an organization called What Works, and it's in the London School of Economics. And it's a, a job or one of its functions is to review the literature on economic development programs and figure out from the research that's been done on the efficacy of those programs, what works. So that when another organization, another government decides it's gonna do something, uh, this is uh, the place that they can check to see what works. And within the um, business advice area, the export promotion agencies thing, their uh, 2018 review of what works was that market information is more effective and less expensive uh, than market service provision. So market service provision is market entry openings, you know, um, having trade advisors in post that sort of thing. So market information was one of the most efficacious results. So, hey, I'm in the right business. Um, so then I looked at what my minister, my minister, of course, my very own minister, because she is the minister of small business and export promotion and international trade. So she's definitely my minister, what she's supposed to be doing. Her first mandate letter in December 2019 uh, was looking at current programming. So I say, yeah, I do that. <laughs> and um, working with the diaspora, and I do that. Uh, most recently, she had an, a supplemental mandate letter in January this year, and added to the original uh, uh, mandate were a very specific interest in the digital marketplace. So um, that's something that, uh, that I, so I, I'm glad, uh, I, I'm not connected very well in that area. Um, so I haven't figured out how to use that to pin myself to that particular thing as well, but I'm working on it. Hey, Zoom is good practice. Okay, so now going to what's available. Uh, the granddaddy, of course, is the step-by-step -step guide to exporting from the Trade Commissioner Service. And uh, the steps down the left-hand side are pretty much what I think I would have said. First of all, are you ready? Uh, secondly, can you cop, um, um, can you follow a value chain? Do you know somebody who's already in the business who will take you there or give you some kind of connection? Are you already connected? So that's a good thing. Uh, step three is the export plan. And step four is identify your target market. So this is where Maggie steps in. Uh, and at that point, um, there are th uh, three stages in step four. Uh, stage one is screen potential markets. And they say, go and look at 10 or 15 possible markets and another three or five that you think might be interesting. And then research the hell out of them. <laughs> to be honest, a small business is not going to do that. And when they say start with large markets and fast growing markets, we can begin to see that this is out of date because no large market is fast growing these days. OK, so step to stage two of this access your marketplace is a, a laundry list of the things you should look for. And if they haven't been put off already, they will, the small business is certainly put off at this point because you're going to look at um, trends, overall sales, amount imported, the competition, share of the market of imports, cultural differences, channels, business practice, barriers, export controls. The only one they probably actually look at is incentives. 
So I did need to highlight that one because they all know they have to go and look at incentives and we're very good at telling them what incentives there. Okay, so um, so at this point, I'm sorry, I'm gonna step into Maggie's, Maggie's market research thing. So my first four steps are pretty much the same. Step one, readiness. Do you have the time, equipment and utensils? And I'm gonna talk about how I'm gonna make a fruit pie. So I'm gonna make a fruit pie and when I'm, am I ready? Have I got the time, the equipment and the utensils? Right, that's all right. Value chain. Can I copy how mom does it? Right, that's basically what value chains are. That's all right. Export plan. Well, that's the recipe, right? So have you got the right recipe? Okay. So now we get to this, assess your target, let's say an ingredient. I haven't decided whether I'm going to make apple pies or peach pies or pear pies or any other kind of pie. Okay, so what would I do at this point? Um, what I would do is have to, at this point, decide what, what fruit am I going to use? And I'm supposed to assess all these different fruits and decide when, which one's going to make the best pie, right? You know, I don't think it's actually going to happen. Um, uh, as, a, as it happens, uh, Trade Commission of Surface has actually a couple of rules of thumb. The first is uh, follow your customer. In other words, the um, value chain thing, follow a customer, um, which would work if, if it was okay that the customer was going somewhere convenient. But uh, I did actually meet a small business whose customer, Magna International, wanted him to export to Lithuania and was not helping. So. Um, uh, so following Magna, he was going to lose the contract, his Ontario contract with Magna, if he didn't go. And uh, he really needed a lot of help there. So, so um, and I have to say some of our, our um, oh, and the second step that they want to do is go for the free trade agreements. Well, you know, we have some pretty hokey free trade agreements like Honduras and, and Jordan, places you do not want to send a beginner. So, um, and uh, so, um, you know, some of the kind of broad brush advice about choosing markets is not terribly helpful. And uh, stage uh, three is draw a conclusion from where you're going. So mostly what happens is the small business have already decided they're going to go somewhere where they already know people. That's why I'm, when I'm working with immigrants, that's very obvious that that's happening. Or they're going to go to the easy place. I'm working with a client right now who wants to go to the US, which is not the easiest place. Um, but uh, that's, uh, to be honest, that's what's happening. And so they're skipping this important step. I'm just going to cover a couple of other guides to show you that not all guides are quite as um, daunting as the step-by-step -step guide to exporting. But if you have any influence with uh, Trade Commissioner Service, please have them updated. All right, so here's EDCs, one of EDCs, many introductions to exporting. Um, it also on chapter three, you'll see the green arrow has how to narrow your list down. Well, if you've only got one, you don't have to narrow it. So that's a good start. And it doesn't give any other guidance pretty much on how to do it. However, I love the EDC guide because of the two circled chapters, dealing with contracts and getting paid. Now these speak exactly to the small business. They that resonates very much faster than you have to plan your market, right? So that one's good. I love those pragmatic sections. And to me, let's keep the pie analogy. These are for people who like to think the process all the way through. They are the equivalent of get the butter out of the freezer and preheat the oven, right? So those, those instructions, um, are incredibly important. And, and I have to say that uh, EDC is very good about this very business-like approach to things. Now, we do have to have strokes for folks and uh, there are a number of other guides and the um, uh, guide to online guide to exporting, which is now horribly out of date, um, hasn't been updated for five, six years. Um, does have a number of these and I keep up to date on them. And the next one I'm going to show you is actually for people who like to learn to cook through YouTube. So what this is, is Craft Ontario and the uh, um, uh, Labour Force Group um, community service that works with the cultural sector have a series of uh, 
guides called How to Sell Internationally, which are little YouTubes or yeah, I guess they're YouTube videos anyway, um, from individuals, they're all women, as you can see, because most craft people are, who have already done this. And that's a great way for us, very small businesses to get the hang of it and feel very comfortable. Um, the, the information is not always correct. It's not always current, but it works. And so we're not talking about going to cooking school here. We're talking about standing next to mom and being shown how to do it. And I think that really is motivational as much as informative. So I'm, I'm all for those. And the more I can find like that, the happier I am. Okay, so the step that I have to help with is unfortunately the export plan. And I'm sure you've met the export plan before. The export plan is a whole laundry list of all the bloody things you're supposed to be looking for. Uh, it is very sensible. It, all of those things may or may not have an effect. And they are essentially what to research. And again, it's overwhelming. But it is necessary for them to complete export plans, so I do work at it. Um, it again, it, once a small business sees that, it's not really surprising that they, um, they uh, chip it. Now, first of all, I'm going to talk some tech terminology. In the market research area, the terminology is very indistinct and the government is very bad at muddling people. So I'm going to have a word with two government people here to say, market is the end customer and marketplace is where that customer lives. And throughout the guides, most of the government agencies confuse those two things about what, when they're talking about country and when they're talking about customer. So I try not to do that. So that's a first step, that's a very important distinction. The second distinction is the distinction that's highlighted on this page, which is the difference between market and marketing. So marketing is a pull activity. It's something you do to attract the attention of the end customer so that they come to you. Market entry is a push activity. It's something that you're getting your products and services into the marketplace and then into the customer's hands. So the advice in those two sections is buried in the export plan or under TCS's export plan under market entry. The two things are totally confused there, promotion and uh, market entry. Now, some activities and that one that they mostly do, which is trade shows, of course, does both those things. And therefore it's understandable that it should be put like this. But for a beginner, it's, it's quite confusing, right? So, um, uh, the confusion between market research and marketing research is quite common. Um, I'll explain a little bit later why that should be so, um, but I, I always distinguish them and I try to spell out the difference, right? So having given you a wrap over your knuckles, EDC, uh, <laughs> now I'm going to go on and look at where I can help. Well, you can see all over the export plan, anywhere that's blue, I'm going to help. And uh, what's important though, will depend on where the product, what the product or service is, what the country is, uh, what the geographical location is like, the marketplace environment. So is it a difficult environment or not? The uh, small businesses experience already, um, whether they are in fact only selling perhaps in Ontario and haven't even had a clue about selling anywhere else. So, um, so helping them decide what's important is part of what I do. Some of the things here that are not highlighted are, in fact, because they are decisions. They are pieces of information that appear in the export plan, but they are not research. So purchase process and buying criteria is information, but it can't be found easily uh, through market research. But target market customers, pricing strategy, promotion strategy, those are decisions. They are the answer or the conclusion from the market research that's been done. So once again, the market using the export plan as a framework is confusing to small businesses because they've mixed up their answers and their questions here. If it was me, I'd rewrite the export plan as well. So, okay. So in the, realistically, in my view, um, market research in fact covers all of the meanings of market it covers marketplace it covers the market customer it covers the 
uh, market entry, it covers marketing. <laughs> Any research that I can do is gonna help all of those things. Right? So that's a good thing. Uh, so my own step-by-step -step suggestion for doing market research of any kind, when you want to find fruit to populate your export plan is first of all, you learn to recognize a fruit tree. That's to recognize a good source when you see it. The second is shake the tree. So actually get out there and see what comes out of a source. I can give people lists of sources forever, but unless I show them what actually comes out of the tree when they shake it, uh, they don't do anything. Then, so that's my first two steps. My second, third step is ask your mother's advice, which means go to a trade advisor and say, I've got all this juicy stuff. What am I supposed to do with it? Right? And, and I explain to them that they should go to the trade advisor when they've got holes all over their export plan because the export advisor said, ah, yes, that fits there, that fits there, you've moved this, it should be over here. That's a decision, not a question, right? So that's what the trade advisor does. Mom says, okay, this is the order you do it in and this is what happens. And then if necessary, you go back and you climb a tree to get the really good stuff. So you go climb a tree that EDC has research people who will help with that. You go climb a tree, go buy some market research. You go climb a tree by digging deeper into whatever. Um, and so that is the next uh, lesson that they always have to learn, even the ones who start here in Canada, that market research is iterative. You do a bit, look and see what you've got, go check with somebody and go and do a bit more. And then you go and do a bit more, and then you go and do a bit more. And eventually, of course, you have to write it down. And the trade advisor is there to bully you into writing it down and doing something about it. Now, we have, unfortunately, in our world, a very big catch-22, that there is no funding for research until you get to can export, and can export requires you have an export plan. So there isn't any real support out there for market research until they've got to the point where they probably don't need as much anymore. They can probably wing it from there. So something hinky about that too. But you know, now I'm not associated with COEF, I can say these things. So this is rather good. Anyway, I want to put that up as a big catch 22. I myself can't do anything about that, except by trying to fill in some of these things. All right, so let's go reality. I used to be an ardent member and active and very active member of the Marketing Research and Intelligence Association here in Ontario, in Canada. It is called marketing research because the bigger, um, companies only do marketing research. They don't research their markets. They research how to sell to the people that they've already got. And that's called marketing. In fact, in reality, the, this research was done by MRIA when I was um, chairman of the B2B group. And um, the uh, research that they did was on small and medium businesses. Only the largest Canadian companies have market research departments or buy research. Uh, the survey that they did, MRIA, found that only 10% of SMEs have any budget at all for market research, and it's usually less than $10,000 a year. Right? Only 10% of all those 45,000 companies that we want to get to have, any, have put any budget aside at all, which is why I'm self-employed and poor. Anyway, not to worry about that, that's primary research, because what I do is a secondary research, and secondary research doesn't require, this was a major survey, they surveyed 500 companies to get this data. So it was an expensive survey. Um, I do secondary research and this comes from um, uh, financial performance data. I don't know if you've noticed this on um, I said Canada's website, Industry Canada's website. It is uh, income tax returns from small businesses. Sales up to 5 million, uh, bottom end 30,000 because that's the GST cutoff. And you can see what small businesses spend on services. So here, your um, logistics people will be interested to see that in the manufacturing sector, uh, only 26% of the small business respondents actually spend have budget and, and declare expenses in the shipping warehousing expenses area. In the wholesale area, it's a little bit more, but not very much more. Um, my area isn't easily identifiable because it's both professional business fees and to a certain extent advertising and promotion. But even then, those are small dollars. 
Those are actual dollars from actual income tax returns. So uh, if your professional and business fees include your tax man, as well as your bookkeeper, uh, then my bet is that only of that $14.2,000 spent on business and professional fees, I'd be very surprised if even 200 of it went to a market researcher. Okay, the nice thing about secondary research though, is that it is free. <laughs> and um, it's actually very much more robust than the piddly piece of market research that the MRIA did because it covers, as you see from the sample, a huge number of companies, 20, almost 50,000 companies were surveyed. All right, so, um, so it's much more robust information, it's just not as narrow. And that's typical of secondary market research. It's not, it doesn't always hit the mark. Um, so the next thing I thought of was, I think um, this was EDC uh, reviewed this source, this next source, Market Finder from Google. I have to say, I'm sorry, it's not ready for prime time yet. They're using artificial intelligence, but what they do is they start with a company's website. So small businesses are not going to be uh, very happy to have Google trolling their website to see what they do. Uh, but secondly, um, it then weights things. It goes and looks around the world to, to find stuff. And unfortunately, it's a focus on consumer markets, which you can tell because it, um, it looks at search demands and disposable income. So e-commerce, in fact, consumer markets based on e-commerce. So this is not to say this isn't a market but it's not necessarily the best market they could be looking at. And if you're selling um, equipment to go into slaughterhouses, this is not going to work. Um, it probably wouldn't work for the US because they aren't able to get their data down to the level, uh, search demand data down to the level that would be useful for targeting a particular part of the US. And it might not work for services since a lot of the data sources are about exports and Canada's export experience in the world is not related to services and services is a huge section so i'm not i don't think ai is to the rescue just yet so probably i'm still got a job all right so um here's what i tell people to do when they find information this is typically out of this is from my first steps in exporting guide uh, i have lots and lots of resources in the guide and i say my biggest problem is to get people to actually shake the shake them and look and see what's in them um, and I do have examples. So I'm going to give you an example here. Um, the trade data online has to be my favorite database ever. And it provides factual information and points to the top current markets, as well as some no hopers from a small business's point of view. You know, if, if there are no sales of jam from Croatia in Canada, then you're not going to be importing Croatian jam. If there are no sales of jam from Canada to Croatia, then you're not going to go and try that either. Um, it is only, of course, product oriented, so it, it doesn't help terribly there. Um, but it is a good start. Uh, so the next lot is I um, ask and suggest and encourage people to compare statistics. Uh, it's no good saying there are a lot of people somewhere, let's say China or India, if you don't know what kind of people they are. So um, uh, I compare. So I am going to shake uh, this UN data orchard. United Nations data is actually 34 databases from pulled from all over the United Nations. And uh, there's a statistics analysis of it um, elsewhere. But it covers all kinds of stuff. And just to show you what happens when I shake that tree, I'm going to shake a tree in that orchard. In 2017, internet use in Europe average was 78.5% of the population 18 years and older. In Canada, it was 91. Okay, so right now we already know that Europe is not, although you would think it would be, is not. Now it was not then. In Italy, the number was only 63%. Right now, I, you wouldn't know this, but I lived in Italy a long time. Italy has a terrible telephone system, so it was really slow on the uptake. <laughs> um, so those are pairs. I shook the internet tree uh, uh, from the UN orchard and I found some pairs, right? Which give me a better idea, perhaps where not to go in Europe and what not to expect. I'm not to expect quite such good coverage. 
Right. Uh, that data comes from the International Telecommunications Union, so one of the trees in the orchard. And also, I found in that database that Italy's 2011 census shows the number of households accessing the internet in four cities, Milan, Naples, Rome, and Turin already collected by the UN Statistical Office from the National Statistical Office in Italy, which would be in Italian. So right off, we have the benefit of moving the data. It's got older and older, as you can see, but we've moved it into something that we can actually deal with right away. And you know, proportionally is good. And the UN actually links to the, the UN homepage links to the most statistical offices. So it's very easy to find that. So old data isn't bad data, um, and it's, it's good data because it tells you where not to go as much as where to go. So this is another lot of old data. Any old data will do. This is from the World Trade Organization. It is part of their tariffs collection. Um, it is the average, um, well, actually the most favored nation, average tariff in, by HS code at six digit level for the countries over the world. And you hover your mouse over a country in the world. So I've hovered it over Brazil and you get a statement as to the tariff. So um, this tariff here is the average tariff in 2019 for Brazil. The average tariff was 13 and a half percent. Now, if you're a Canadian small business used to importing, uh, that would be stunning because the average tariff in Canada is 4%. If you hover over it, you can see that. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, something like 60% of the tariff lines are zero anyway. So um, right off, we can see some places we do not want to go to. Uh, we can see that India is going to be more expensive than China because the color is redder. Right? That's a very quick way of saying, where do I want to be? There are a few places you really do not want to go. Um, but generally speaking, you know, we part of NAFTA, Mexico, you would think, well, yes, but it is in general higher. We are beneficial for it, but in general, their tariff structure is higher. So um, that's a, another useful, slightly out of date source, but also helps with serendipity and saying, okay, you know, within Africa, where's a good place to go? Or, you know, why do I research India and China? Thank you. This is uh, very practical. And I love your analogy about uh, the orchard and the jam and the, the pie. Oh, Till I get to the well. pie. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like how you've uh, indicated uh, at different levels of specificities, because sometimes businesses just need uh, a, a high overview uh, yeah. to help them guide them in, term, in terms of which path to take. Well, we've got a couple more minutes, uh, and I want to make sure that we have some questions before we go to our but, next presentation. So I'll I know, but please, yeah. can I can I rush through? I rush through my rest of them. Okay. Sure. So when I this uh, next example is when I'm doing for the U.S. When you compare statistics, you've got to think that you've got the right one. So here I've compared GDP and per, building permits, but the commonality is that the city in the U.S. is always defined the same way, right? So you. That's an important thing to do to make sure that the when you compare statistics, they are to the same base. Um, you also start with good data that you've already found somewhere else and grow it. So here, this is an example of growing a pearl, where you start with a core piece of information which is valuable, and you see what you can do with it. And this is example of census data that comes from the Bureau of census who does a consumer expenditure survey but pops it out into the statistics area through two different agencies with two different mandates one of them is the uh, bureau of labor statistics who cares about the cost of living and the other is the bureau of economic analysis which concerns itself with gdp um, they still have the same it's from the same source uh, but the data comes out differently and so what we've got there is two cultivars of the same tree we have, we have a peach tree, but two cultivars. We have to make sure that the numbers are actually equal. And I have to say when I was, oh, you don't want this one. Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, I used to send my students off to look for uh, articles about trade or market research rather. And this one, I handicapped myself in this game by saying I would only look in the cartoons. This is an example of having not checked the, um, uh, not checked the units um, they are, this is, we come in peace, 
uh, but they've dropped one of those little hearts and they hadn't realized that they were candies. Uh, <laughs> so um, some of you will remember the Gimli glider. So we, most Canadians get that one. All right, that's poor secondary research. Uh, another thing is to use raid the pantry. Uh, when, this is, I raid the economist all the time. Uh, raid a good pantry and look and see what else it has um, that will tell you. So the, the uh, economist found a, a survey from, the, from India, but it was 2012, but they updated it using World Inequality Report from 2018. So that gave me a hint. And uh, that brings me very quickly to uh, uh, going out into market entry, which is where the other government agencies help. You go out into the market with the other government agencies to get primary research. And primary research tests your experience here. And the primary research tree that you shake to find out who's going to take you there is Ontario's trade calendar. I just love this one. Anyway, so that, of course, and can export, of course, supports trade shows, so that's good. So here, I'm, I'm a hand off. This is the last slide, promise. promise. OK, so um, the export plan that I refer people to is not Trade Commissioner's export plan, but the one from the Small Business Administration. And the reason for that is it explains why you're looking for information. And also, it has Maggie's first rule of secondary research. Always write down where you found the information because you'll never find it again. <laughs> and at that point, I hand over to three. Uh, I have three tips for going on to other people. People who give you tips, which is the new export help hub at EDC. People who give you tools, such as EDC's um, contract materials. And people who take you to trade shows. And you get that, of course, through people like Magnet. And that's, I've stopped. So. Maggie, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very, very practical. A nice uh, handoff, your last slide, uh, to our, our, our next speaker as well at, uh, at EDC. Uh, before we ask uh, Navi to uh, begin on his presentation on international uh, contracts, are there any uh, particular questions for Maggie? I mean, that was so wonderful in terms of the uh, comprehensive nature of the presentation, the practical insights that you provided. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that this is gonna be a very popular uh, viewed uh, session. So Maggie, thank you so much uh, uh, for that. Uh, we have your information and uh, we will uh, uh, recommend uh, that those that are interested in uh, market research uh, to, uh, to employ your services, because certainly it is uh, presented in a way uh, that is, uh, is not only comprehensive, but have uh, the nuances that are very practical and save companies a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of mistakes. So thank you, Maggie, so much uh, for, uh, for doing that. My pleasure. So no questions, that's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my immigrants have a lot of questions. <laughs> well, uh, and that's so wonderful that you're uh, you're doing that as well because that uh, certainly provides confidence uh, for those that are looking to uh, start export or import uh, businesses or those that are uh, looking to uh, establish new markets. Uh, and I think it's a testament to your presentation that there weren't any questions because it was so comprehensive. Good job. <laughs> uh, we do have a hard stop at about a uh, little after nine o'clock. And uh, so Nav, uh, um, I uh, am looking forward to your presentation as well. Nav is no yeah. stranger to uh, our network and I'll let you get right to it. Uh, sure. Uh, Navi, international contracts. Please yeah. go ahead. Uh, Maggie, thanks for the segue. Todd, Lorraine, great seeing you guys. Thanks for having us on. Uh, Badar, Martin, uh, great seeing you guys uh, on here again as well. So uh, yeah, I'll just be mindful of time as well. So uh, Lorraine, you're controlling the screen. So I'll get you just moving on to the next, please. Uh, just to let everybody know off the top, just because my lawyers told me I have to do this, this presentation is for information purposes only. Uh, always consult the legal advice. Um, you know, there's always different nuances out there in the marketplaces and depending on which countries you're dealing with. So, uh, so yeah, just wanted to preface that with this. So Export Development Canada, Maggie, you did a nice job of trying to sell us there. That was just great. But really our mission as... Um, an arm of the Canadian government is really to help Canadian companies go grow and succeed internationally and help them do business internationally. Uh, we do have 
We do work with companies of all sizes from the small ma and pa companies to the large uh, multinationals, uh, Canadian based uh, companies that are multinationals. So we can work with them as well as all, indus all industries and sectors. Obviously there's a few instances where we might be restricted due to uh, government um, uh, sanctions or certain industries where you know, there might be restrictions in, in particular in some areas of military. So, but other than that, we're pretty open into working with uh, all size companies in all sectors. Next slide, Lorraine. So how we can divide EDC is into really four buckets. Uh, the first is our financing bucket, where we primarily work with your commercial bank in terms of helping you obtain additional working capital. Um, not only that, but as you're expanding internationally as well, we can help you access more working capital internationally as well. As well, the other side of it is we can also help where uh, you might have an international buyer that's looking for financing to buy from you. So uh, we have connections where we can partner up with other institutions to where we can help obtain that kind of financing. Insurance, as Maggie mentioned earlier, our credit insurance program, when you're doing international contracts, this is a key component of it, uh, especially even as a selling tool where you know, you're negotiating at the early stages and you can basically use your credit insurance to give extended terms to your customers internationally. So in hopes of them buying you from you more. Our knowledge piece, you know, uh, Maggie mentioned that a couple of resources, but I'll mention a few more resources towards the end of the presentation and our connections. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Lorraine, we have two sets of connections. Uh, one is we have relationships with foreign buyers. When they do come to Canada, uh, we help set them up with Canadian uh, content. Uh, so that way they can build a relationship there. And we then obviously help those Canadian companies and build those relationships as well. In addition, we do have 21 offices around the world. The three newest ones are Chicago, Atlanta, and Sydney, Australia, where we have feet on the ground to understand those foreign markets and where we find their opportunity for Canadian companies to grow. Um, so this is a great resource. You can always contact our, our reps in those offices directly. And many of these offices are actually co-inhabited with the Canadian consulate or embassy in those locations. So with the trade commissioner's office usually right next door. So it's a great resource to reach out. Next slide, please. And we can go to the next. Perfect. So what to look for when you're actually setting up an international contract? Language, which we might think is an easy part, is actually a really important part of it. You know, English is, you know, probably the international language of business, but there's depending on which foreign market you're dealing with. So that can vary market to market. The other thing too, is what you have to look at is, would you need a translation if you decided on which language to use? Now, even if you look at here in Canada, uh, a lot of times we have English and French translation, but the meaning can be different from one language to the other. So you have to figure out which language in case of a dispute will be the language you go to if you don't have that proper translation. So it's something to look at, which is often overlooked, especially when a contract is written in multiple languages. Second thing is foreign law. So you're dealing with a company, uh, you're in Canada, you're selling to a company in Mexico. Well, both parties may not be interested in dealing with either side's uh, legal system. So, you know, not only do you have to be familiar with each side's legal system, but maybe there's a neutral uh, legal system you might use in your contract. Generally, what we see is UK law or the state of New York law uh, gets used quite a bit internationally. And I know Maggie had mentioned the US originally in her presentation. And the US is also kind of unique as well, is where not only do you have to look at federal law, you also have to look at state to state law as they do operate in a very individualistic uh, way down there. So that's another key point to remember as well. Some of the standard clauses that you'd have to look at, which uh, which League, which legal system is going to be governing uh, the contract in case there is a dispute. That's very key. So you have that set out up front so you don't have any questions later on. Have that clearly uh, written out there. And as I mentioned, you have the uh, neutral site law as well to use so that way both parties have to agree to it. The forum selection clause is really to say, you know, if there is a dispute, how, what are the steps to take? How do we go forward to resolving it? Is it international arbitration? So those steps were always laid out. The way I like to describe it is, you never wanna think of having a prenup, you might not need it, but it's always the safe fallback just in case something happens. The termination, this is very important as well too, where 
uh, what are the scenarios that you can uh, terminate the contract? And in this case, you wanna be very conservative and look at any option possible from both sides. And what you want also wanna realize is what, is what are the termination clauses that your counterparty is proposing and why are they proposing that? There might be some loopholes you're looking for, an easy way out. So take a look at that and how many days notice do they each side have to give in order to terminate a clause out of the contract. Damages and limitation of liability. This is basically who would owe what um, it's already set out. So basically if you have a contract where you're building something and maybe it's just the cost that have you incurred up to that point, or it might be some marketing costs incurred as well too. So it's really key to understand if you have that laid out at the beginning part. Potential problems you might see uh, when a contract's put together or, see here, there we go. Um, what you might see is if you're keeping it too simple, it's just keeping too much room for error. So that's something you have to be care. And the other side too is you might feel that if I put too much in, then the other side might scare it off. But you're really trying to protect yourself as well too. Where that might happen is if you're dealing with a larger company internationally, that's uh, you know, say a big auto company in the US or you know, the big software companies around the world, you might think they have more power, but then you have to understand and read their contract as well. Especially that fine print at the very bottom, that a lot of time gets missed out as well too. The other thing you want to might look at is the INCO terms, which are the international contract terms. These are set out by the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and towards the end of my presentation in the resort section, I will have some resources where you can actually take the courses to be INCO terms certified and the resources to where you can get this information. Great resource. It's a European based organization. I believe in France, and uh, but the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has direct links into there. So I will have the contacts for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in my presentation. Some other con common mistakes that we might see out there is a lot of people, especially in the trading industry, they'll use text messages. And those are just really direct orders and there's not really a lot more to it. That can relieve you in a lot of binds. I've seen that in many cases where people Companies have tried to claim insurance on those kind of uh, contracts, which they call, uh, using text messages. The detail just is not there. And those, those kind of contracts can end up costing you a lot more in the long run. The key here is involving a lawyer. You never want to bring a lawyer in at the end. Have that relation set up at the beginning. And that way, when you do need a lawyer towards the end, when something does come up, well, then you've already got the relation set up. And the other key too is, having somebody in the legal field that might be in the jurisdiction you're dealing with. The laws are a lot different. So maybe even if it could be a firm here that has representation in that international marketplace, but also reaching out into that local market, which I'll give you some tips down the road as well. Next slide, Lauren, please. Now, what, what do you do when you have a delayed or canceled contract? We're seeing a lot of that right now, especially with COVID. Uh, supply chains are disrupted. We saw a ship being stuck in the Suez Canal just about a month ago, which interrupted 15% of the world trade. Things happen. So what's the key here is communication is really the big key. So what that means is having an open discussion with your customer, your supply chain, and finding out what really is going on. Maybe they can make some amendments to the contract. Uh, so it's really having that open dialogue and having everything in writing is very important as well. Other things you might want to look at is letting your insurance company know early, hey, I have this issue coming up, what can I do? They will give you great guidance, be it EDC on the credit side of things, or on the other side where it could be marine cargo insurance. In the example of the Suez Canal, that's exactly where that would fit in. So you know what your protection is, what your rights are as well, having that discussion early. Then as well, speaking to your lawyer, on both your Canadian side and on your international side. So you know what rights you would have on, from a legal standpoint as well. But the key here is really to try to work out a solution with your party. Nobody wants to go to a claim situation. Nobody wants to go to a legal situation as the costs can skyrocket and the time may not be worth it as well. But document everything. A phone call is great, but follow up with an email and have everything in writing. And if you're making an amendment to your contract, make sure it's signed or initialed. Because in the end, that's what will keep everything uh, going in court and we have it all covered off. Next slide, please. So how to safeguard your company. There's many uh, organizations, some that uh, Maggie had mentioned earlier. The trade commissioners are a great one. They will 
uh, help you, especially when you're looking at the contacts in the international marketplace, be it an accountant, be it a lawyer, they have those kind of contacts in the local market. Great resource. Translators are another one too. So that's one of the first steps you want to definitely reach out to. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce, helping you understand INCO terms. That is your guide there for that. Your lawyers, both domestically and internationally. You know, like I said earlier, you want to know what you're getting into beforehand, have that relationship so you know what to expect going down the road. Your bank, be it here in Canada, uh, they're the one that are going to help you with your financing needs and, you know, they could help, they could help get you through a, a tough situation, especially with COVID last year, where the banks and EDC work together quite closely in order, in order to help companies get to uh, put that fire out. Insurance. Uh, the one thing I'll mention here is marine cargo insurance. You've got goods in transit until the other side has title to those goods. You're still responsible for it. So you might as well protect yourself from that. Another great resource is a trade accelerator program. Uh, last year, right on the Brampton Board of Trade, we were trying to have uh, a seminar here. So hopefully we can get that back. But because it's COVID and everything's online, this is an online program. It's a great program where they will help you set an export plan. But not only that, they'll bring in outside resources, other companies, um, other um, government agencies in to help you build that export plan to know what to expect and how to go to that next level. So that is an excellent resource. Uh, if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to myself and Todd, I believe you might have some resources at your end as well too. And of course, how can EDC help you? So next slide, Lorraine. Credit insurance is a big one. When you're dealing internationally, you don't know your buyer, um, you don't know what their financials look like. And a lot of times these foreign buyers will not share their financial information. Having yourself protected there it could be a canceled contract. Uh, it could turn into a dispute. Having that covered initially is great. It's really protection. If you look at your balance sheet, generally it's your receivables that are your biggest asset. Foreign exchange comes into play. You could have a contract that's set out for over two, three years and the foreign exchange fluctuation could happen. Look at the Canadian dollar today as compared to a year ago. Well, when you have something like that, taking advantage of using foreign contracts, foreign, foreign exchange contracts is key. EDC can help you with your bank in order to establish those facilities. Accessing working capital. We all need the money in order to fulfill a contract, be it by EDC helping you guarantee your line of credit here domestically, uh, your purchase order financing, EDC can help there. Or as your company grows internationally, in a lot of cases, companies, you've seen this with uh, Canadian companies, especially in auto, where they've had to set up shop in the US, now even Mexico. Well, the Canadian company might have to look for an acquisition, or even set up shop down there to establish working capital lines internationally, EDC can help guarantee those as well too. So the next thing that you see in international contracts, you don't see as much in Canada where you see it when you're dealing with international marketplace or letters of credit, especially standby letters of credit. You, you might be dealing with performance bonds uh, based on how you're performing in terms of the contract set out. Advanced payment guarantees are another one. You might get an advanced payment However, the other side wants something back to say, hey, I don't know you too well. I want to sure, be sure that money comes back to me. Supplier bonds as well. You're building relationships with your foreign suppliers or even domestic suppliers. You're trying to set out terms with them. Bid bonds. You're bidding on contracts internationally. You might not be at that contract stage yet, but you're bidding on it. And warranty bonds. You might have completed a contract, but now you have the warranty in place. All these, when a letter of credit is issued by your bank, tie up your working capital, either by way of cash or carve out of your operating line. EDC can come and guarantee that portion for you so that can free up your working capital. And again, we work with the bank uh, for that portion as well. Something that we've seen a lot of, especially in the last year with uh, COVID and PPB uh, equipment coming into Canada, advanced payment insurance. A lot of suppliers are now asking for payments up front. Well, that's a lot of money up front and you're not sure when you're gonna get your goods or your equipment well, protect, that's an investment you need to protect as well too. EDC can come in and ensure that as well. Next slide, please. So some resources I've put together. Uh, the first one here, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and the INCO terms. Uh, not only, that's a great resource there. That's where you can register for the course. Uh, there's some free resources as well there. But also EDC has got some uh, links as well where you can uh, uh, tap into in terms of getting additional information. Next slide, Lorraine. Uh, 
Uh, so this is the actual, the International Chamber of Commerce directly in France. This is their resources there. This is all through a subscription process. And uh, so there's a cost base for it. But uh, if you are interested and your company is expanding, it's a great resource to take a look into and even get some of your employees registered under this piece. Next slide. And don't worry, uh, if you are interested in getting these links, feel free to reach out to me or you can reach out to Lorraine and she'll give you my contact information. I will share this presentation with you and the links will be in the presentation. Uh, obviously EDC, our export help hub, as Maggie mentioned, is a great resource, but my EDC, it's a free registration. And what you can do there is you can access all our webinars, all our surveys for free. All you have to do is register once and you'll have access to all that information. The trade commissioners, they have something similar as well. The Business Development Bank of Canada, who are based uh, actually right next door to the uh, Brampton Board of Trade Office, they're another great resource as well. And obviously Canada Customs, knowing what when you're shipping goods out of Canada, so there's still regulations you have to look into, so it's a great resource to touch base with. Um, and the Forum for International Trade Fit, I know Maggie had mentioned that, excellent training program that EDC is part of as well. Next slide. So these are just the links for the different types of programs and services EDC offers. And don't forget, we're not just talking products, we are talking services as well, because a lot of Canadian companies are well known for the services, especially engineering firms uh, that do a lot of work internationally. So EDC can support those companies as well. Next slide. And these are just some of the uh, uh, economic reports that are available on our website. And the next slide is some of the uh, webinars that are available. Big long list coming up, there we go. And these are all on demand, you can uh, access them. I've also split it up between COVID related and uh, just overall. The, the, the best one obviously to watch is Peter Hall. He has his weekly uh, write up that comes out. Definitely subscribe to that, great resource of information. And obviously feel free to reach out to myself. If you go to the next slide, you'll have my contact information or my district manager, Nicole Latour, who's also on the line. Uh, feel free to reach out to either one of us if there's any questions or need additional information or you would like a copy of this presentation. Navi, so hopefully thought I made the time. <laughs> yeah, Navi, thank you very, very much. No uh, yes, we're, uh, we're right on uh, time. And uh, again, another comprehensive uh, presentation that I'm sure will be uh, viewed. Thank you for the uh, uh, additional effort you put into the uh, resources section, the INCO terms, the international contract uh, uh, um, resources, the exporting agencies, the risk mitigation products at EDC, uh, the report surveys and uh, and webinars, all very, very practical, very helpful. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, your investment in, uh, in this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation for us uh, today. Um, we're about to wrap up. Uh, are there any specific questions to, uh, to Navi? Well, then I want to say uh, thank you again to our guests, uh, Maggie uh, Weaver of uh, Shaftesbury Associates and uh, Navi Dami of the Export Development uh, Corporation. This has uh, been uh, the Brampton Board of Trades Trade Network, sponsored by the Export Development uh, Corporation. Lorraine, I want to thank you for uh, uh, organizing such a wonderfully informative and comprehensive uh, uh, outline of uh, getting into international markets, the practical, uh, the nuance. Uh, the resources available. Maggie did a wonderful and uh, entertaining uh, uh, presentation and uh, Navi, uh, just a wonderful pairing, like, uh, like good cheese and wine. Uh, I think this was an amazing uh, presentation uh, and network meeting today. So thank you. Uh, to you uh, all. And uh, in June, uh, June uh, will be our next uh, trade network meeting. Uh, we are in the process of inviting Jog Badwal. Jag Badwal is no uh, stranger to the Branton community, uh, a prominent uh, business person who was appointed just over a year ago, uh, maybe two uh, now, uh, as Ontario's uh, Secretary General Trade uh, uh, Commissioner uh, for Ontario uh, in the Dallas uh, region, southwest uh, uh, United States, including Oklahoma and other uh, uh, states as well. So we are going to extend that invite. Hopefully Jag will be available and uh, we'll learn a little bit more about uh, how you can uh, look at markets in uh, the Dallas and Southwest uh, um, uh, area of the United States. And Todd, to add to that, our next office opening will be Dallas or Houston. Navi, could you say it again, please? Our next office opening international will be in either Dallas or Houston. 
So. Oh, isn't that wonderful? So it's perfect timing there. I'm really happy about that. All right. Well, thank you again, Maggie, Navi, Lorraine. Thank you, Kabir, uh, uh, Badar, and uh, Nicole. And we'll see you again sometime very, very soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Lorraine. Thanks, 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 Th